Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, to moderate this session, and I'm very pleased to welcome a, a, a panel of um, three representing three of the world's largest advisory and audit organisations. Together, those three organisations um, have an annual turnover of over 100 billion, and um, and I think. Yeah, I, I checked it out. Google's a wonderful thing. Um, and I think that um, that tells their interest in this tells us something about what an important thing this is. ESG, environment, social, and governance issues are rapidly becoming the real, really the, the, the new quality standard, if you like, that determines how good your business really is. And a huge opportunity for creating value. And I think a huge opportunity for the digital sector to actually help organisations to use data and to deliver services which actually under underwrite or underline and demonstrate where value is being created in this space. So before you want to hear from the people who actually know something about it, so I will um, briefly introduce, we've got Charlotte is going to talk about the E and uh, I will hand over to her first and then we're going to hear about S from Seamus um, and Dasha will talk about G and then we'll have a question and answer session using the, using the slide. I'll do my best to, uh, to to pick up on the questions and themes that come from Slido, so please do use it. Um, it'll be the primary source of questions, and uh, hopefully we'll have a really interesting and um, informative discussion. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charlotte Bale, as, as Chris um, has introduced me. I lead our advisory and assurance offering in the Isle of Man for Deloitte. Um, I'm pleased today to talk to you about the E um, within ESG, um, or at least an element of it. So, as you can see from this slide, um, the spectrum of topics covered by ESG um, are diverse and expansive. Um, of the E, they're united in their relationship to our physical environment. But going beyond climate for today, um, which has garnered the most significant attention of recent years since the Paris Agreement, um, there are other aspects to E um, that are not as spoken about. Um, and these are the natural resources um, in our ecosystem, our marine, our freshwater, and our terrestrial ecosystems. So I'd like to speak to you today a bit briefly, um, that is, about our biosphere and nature reporting. In 2021, um, the UK Treasury commissioned a report by a Professor Gas Gupta. Um, and what the report looked at was it explored the relationship between biodiversity and our economies. And in case um, you are about to read the 610 page report, a bit of a spoiler alert, um, our economies are intrinsically linked to nature and we are embedded within it. In fact, the World Economic Forum um, valued that 44 trillion of economic value generation um, was moderately or highly dependent on nature. Um, a recent Deloitte report actually looked at the Great Barrier Reef and it valued the Great Barrier Reef at 56 billion, supporting 64,000 jobs. So nature and our economy are intrinsically linked. Um, the current economic and well environmental crisis that we face requires a joint climate and nature approach. It's not enough for us just to be net zero in our emissions, we also need to be nature positive. Um, Professor Das Gupta notes uh, one of his findings in the report um, is that what ultimately is required is a, a global set of standards um, that are underpinned by credible uh, decision um, grade data, which businesses can then embed in their decision making uh, for nature. Um, if you've heard of any ESG frameworks, you've probably heard of the Task Force um, on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, following in its footsteps, um, the suitably named Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. Um, and this comes last Friday, was its third iteration. Um, the final version is expected next September. There's also momentum building in the global policy environment. So 
You'll all likely be aware of COP27 that's been held this week. Um, there's a twin COP, uh, COP15, which is the biodiversity COP. Um, I don't know how many times I've said COP in a sentence, but that is being held in Montreal in December. Um, the aim of that COP is to generate um, a number of goals. So in the same way that the Paris Agreement achieved a set um, amount of goals for climate, we're hoping that COP15 will do the same for nature. Uh, nature then is a key uh, element of our island life um, and we should be incredibly proud, um, as we all will know in this room, of our biosphere status. In fact, not only biosphere status, but the world's only entire nation biosphere. If any jurisdiction then is going to demonstrate a leading stance in nature to strengthen and protect its economy, why not the Isle of Man? And if you're thinking, what does nature reporting have to do with the digital conference? Uh, this is why. So there are inherent data challenges. Um, we've seen already with emissions reporting um, around the gathering of source data and source data and then the subsequent analysis and storage of it. We don't have always the most robust or comprehen comprehensive systems to precisely report on what is required. Specifically, nature could be argued as even more complex. Um, added complications around geospatial data, so that is where locational data, um, and the positive and negative effects that have to be taken into account for um, our impact and dependencies on nature. If we don't quantify our impact and the benefits um, of nature, we risk overlooking it entirely. Um, and that does not address the increasing pressures that stakeholders are asking for in relation to reporting on nature. To put it simply, what gets measured gets managed. And as shown on the slide, um, on the flip side of those challenges, there are a number of key opportunities for our digital sector. Thank you. I'll pass over to Seamus for the F. Hello, all. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm Seamus. Um, I work at KPMG in the UK uh, in our economics team. That picture at the start was actually me. I had slightly more hair on my head and less on my face. Uh, but this is what I look like now. Still the same person. Um, so I will. I won't go through this slide in much detail. Obviously, this is um, this has already been through. But at KPMG, we like to look at things in terms of the four P's when we're thinking about ESG. Um, those are planet, people, prosperity and principles of governance, where we have planet falling into the E, people and prosperity under S, and then principles of governance um, under the G. Um, I won't spend much time on the E and the G, obviously we've got other people doing that, but you can see up here what we generally look at um, as part of those. Um, so focusing in a bit more on the S itself, um, what do we look at when we think about um, people and prosperity? Well, the first is um, work, um, workforce and skills for the future. So this is really about training staff that you already have, but also, you know, it's also about attracting, uh, attracting and retaining the best staff possible. So it's in putting in uh, relevant training programs, but also making yourself as an organization attractive for the very best staff um, you can possibly get. Um, the second area um, under people is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, the next slide, I'll come on to that in a little bit more detail, so I won't cover it in much detail here. Um, so, so I'll leave that for afterwards. Um, next, we've got health and safety. Um, this is very much as it says in the tin, it's not the most interesting topic, but everyone should feel you know, safe when they come to work, um, and you should put in policies and procedures into place to make sure that that is actually the case. Uh, next, we move on to prosperity. So what do we have here? A lot of people, when you think about the S, you really think about the people, you think about diversity and inclusion, you think about your workforce, which is obviously extremely important. But economic contribution is also uh, very important in terms of not only um, what you're contributing as an overall business, but also what you contribute to local economies, um, particularly in this case, obviously here on the island, um, is very important to measure and to keep track of exactly what that economic contribution looks like. Next, we have social contribution. Um, so here we're really thinking about um, the types of you know, your, social capital, your, your social capital and what you contribute to society, uh, and really something that's relatively hard to track. A lot of businesses have come under um, criticism in the past for their social contribution. Actually, you know, you have the, the usual going out and painting the fence and not having much of a much of a um, theme around that or actually strategy around it. But we are increasingly seeing organisations putting their social contribution right at the forefront of everything they do, and it's really core um, to, to businesses. Finally, we have R and D and innovation. 
obviously extremely important that we continue to develop, continue to innovate, not only as an organisation, but this ensures uh, sustainable use of resources going forward, which obviously is, is great for ESG as well. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes talking about diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, I know it's something that's increasingly being talked about, and something we've talked about a bit, bit in the past before, but traditionally when we talk about DE&I, or DNI as some people call it, I think there's a very heavy focus on the diversity, and that's around target setting and representation within organisations, which is extremely important, but also what we need to consider is the kind of DE&I as well, so the equity and inclusion. What do we mean by equity? We mean that everyone that comes to work is treated fairly, is given equal opportunity, and is uh, provided with what they need to flourish. So it takes into account people's differences and considers exactly what they need to flourish in their current role. And inclusion is essentially, as it says, is making sure that people are included in decision making, and that often leads to better results, which we'll come on to the second of the questions, I'm sure. Um, but it's really about including people, so not just having the people uh, there um, as some, some people paraphrased earlier, box ticking, but actually having people included uh, in the organisation um, and given a fair representation. In terms of what people can do to drop the, uh, to, to push forward the ENI, there's quite a few different areas here, and this doesn't even cover uh, everything that can be done, but I'll just touch on a few of them very briefly. The first one is bias awareness. Um, so we know from various different studies that there is traditionally some level of unconscious bias uh, in workplaces. And we really need to the first step to combating that bias and to make sure um, that it's not you know, having a negative impact on an organisation is acknowledging that it exists. Then you can do various, various bits of training, uh, also in terms of recruitment, there's various steps you can take to make sure that unconscious bias um, is minimised. Um, the next thing I'm going to touch on um, is in terms of tracking progress. So we mentioned, um, as Charlotte just mentioned, data is often hard to come by when it comes to ESG and tracking progress and making sure that you're not only setting targets you've got a baseline which you start from and then track against that over time is of course extremely important. Finally, planning for the long term. I mean, that's what any good business should be doing anyway, but it's extremely important for DE&I that, that we do plan for the long term. Because of course, we can set targets to have representation at senior levels for you know, different races, uh, different sexes and so on. But actually what makes that extremely easy is having fair representation across an organisation. Then over time, you will automatically grow into an organisation that has that representation um, at the top level as well. Uh, so that's just a few of these areas I'm sure we'll touch on again in the questioning, but I'll hand over to Dasha to discuss G. Afternoon all, hi. Uh, so my name's Dasha, um, PwC Director. I focus primarily on corporate reporting, which in recent years has very much come more and more into focus with the ESG agenda, thus being here with you today. I get to talk about the G, the governance. Um, so I was going to just touch very briefly on what it is, why it's important, how that then plays into the ESG agenda specifically. Then a little bit of a touch on, well, what if it goes wrong, or what is perceived to go wrong, not necessarily goes wrong, but seem to have gone wrong. And then just some final thoughts on what next, or what would I recommend, or what would we recommend that, that you guys think about and what businesses do. Um, so what is governance and why is it important? Um, it's funny, it's the last letter of the G, but it's kind of the foundation of everything, right? It's, it's the foundation of looking to set a tone for your business and drive a business in a certain direction, um, trying to create some effective management. What is the purpose of the business that you're working in and how are you going to drive that through your organisation? Because that really will then contribute to the long-term success. And there is certain kind of, I suppose you might call hygiene factors people tend to associate with governance and we talk a lot about uh, the diversity of the board as Seamus was just touching on at the very top level and through the organisation and um, a big focus on things like anti-bribery and corruption, anti-money laundering, so how do you operate as an organisation to operate ethically and to do good business and I think it's really interesting that it, it's pushing more and more um, the governance agenda into private and smaller businesses. It used to be, it's a public company thing, right? It's a public company, you're a stakeholder of my money and my investment, I want to know how these big multinational listed companies are governed uh, and what structure they have. But these days, it's not just financial investors that ask these questions, it's employees that are asking the questions of the companies they work for, it's customers that are asking these things about the companies <coughs> they buy from. And so we see the kind of societal pressure pushing in and it's become much more uh, an issue on the agenda for smaller privately owned companies as well as those big listed companies. 
Um, so it's really interesting to see that we're seeing this change kind of come through, even though in the Isle of Man, there's nothing particularly mandated here in this space across the EDS or the G, but we are seeing change coming through. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges, and I have no doubt it will come up in discussion later, is how, how to then translate something that started off as what are the big FTSE 100 companies doing here into what do I do? I'm a relatively small business based on the Isle of Man or a medium sized or big business, but it's a different environment I work in. How do you sort of make it fit for purpose and tailor for you? And, and I mean, the answer is that you can and you should. Uh, you don't have to operate as a FTSE 100 would operate, but to me it's about um, having a conscious thought of what do I want to do, what is my purpose, and how do I push that through my organisation. And depending how dispersed your organisation is, you will come at that challenge in a very different way. If we move into sort of focusing on the ESG sphere particularly, and how governance would work there as underpinning what you do with an ESG strategy, um, the four pillars I've got on the slides here, in, in many ways actually, could be the four pillars of governing any particular area of, of a company strategy, but focusing on ESG, because that's what we need to talk about. Um, <coughs> leadership and tone at the top. People have to believe that it matters to the guys at the top if they're really going to buy into any kind of change and purpose of the company or values and how you want them to operate. So it's very important to walk the talk. Don't say that you're really into carbon emissions and then jet off to New York every weekend for business trips and things like that. People just won't, it won't be credible. So there's a really important aspect of leadership here and then how you're going to monitor and continue to show that importance to the rest of the organization. That drives into accountability. Who in your organization will be looking at this? Um, do they have the time to do this job properly? It's something new, it's something different. It does take time and effort. Do they actually have a passion for it? That would be helpful too. Who do you have? What structure do they then have? And how are they reporting up to the leadership? So that's really important to think about when you're trying to set yourself on a path here. Um, transparency as well, very key from a government pers governance perspective. I've put on the top of the slide here, trust and be trusted. The, this is with a view to, often when you start on an ESG journey, you want to work out where you are to start with, and it might not be a very pretty picture because it's the first time you've looked at this. And you think, oh goodness, I'm not sure I want to be telling the world that these are my carbon emissions and that doesn't look very good. Um, but my recommendation would be, and it seems to be, that actually coming at it with a blank sheet of paper and saying, well, I'm going to trust it. If I do a good job to understand where I am and plan my journey to where I'm going to go, you will start to get the buy-in, the value that you're looking for from those stakeholders, rather than making it look better than it is and people not buying it, thinking it's not credible and therefore not believing that you're actually trying to make a difference in this space. Trust and be trusted. Um, and then finally, we've kind of touched on it, um, Seamus and uh, Charlotte as well, reporting and assurance, so gathering some information. It can be hard to gather information about this kind of stuff because we've not really set our businesses up to gather information about nature usage or diversity stats or something like that. What information do you want? Where are you gathering it from? And who are you reporting it to? And it can be difficult to get, and then we actually see quite a lot in this space, people start to report information and they start to update it and refine it and realise they didn't quite capture it right in the first place. Think about where you're getting it from, do some dry runs, get it right, because otherwise you kind of undermine everything that you're trying to do. Um, when it goes wrong, we've probably all heard the term greenwashing. So this is, and I do say when it goes wrong or is perceived to have done, I've got some names of companies on the slide here where um, there have been accusations in the press of greenwashing. That is some rhetoric or something out there where people are accusing these companies of not having thought it through in enough depth, trying to make them sound like they're doing something with much more impact than it actually has. Um, and this is an interesting one, Amazon versus Microsoft. Amazon have some uh, targets that they're looking to achieve and the criticism came at them from Greenpeace saying, you're saying you're capturing your emissions and you're going to reduce emissions, but you're ignoring a huge part of that, which is emissions within your supply chain. And if that's the case, and I don't believe you're trying to do the job properly, this is that trust and be trusted point I was talking about earlier. So that's really interesting. It's got to go deep enough to have credibility. Um, H&M, a culture's clothing line. They had an ethical clothing line. They came under a lot of criticism in Norway. They're, they're a very big brand in Norway. 
Um, because when actually someone really questioned it and said, well, how do you know about the conditions of the workforce making your clothes? What have you done to check what chemicals are going into this? There didn't seem to be a lot of substance there. Now, please do not get me wrong, I'm not standing here saying these companies have done this maliciously. I'm not standing here saying there's not some robust thought behind these things on the slide because there will be. Maybe I'm naive saying so, I believe there really will be. Um, but what I think we can learn from this is it's hard to get right and people will challenge about how deep you have gone and how well you have thought out the strategy that you embark on. So governance, I guess, is a foundation to, to, to help it be as robust as possible and push through the organisation, I think, protects companies against this kind of criticism. I think big companies will always be criticised because there's a lot to go for and they're the big dogs, right? Um, so where does that leave us? I would suggest, as I say in the room, I mean, what next? I, I really do think it's an important thing for companies to um, embrace the ESG agenda. Uh, think about what you're going to do and how. It doesn't mean you have to turn into Greta Thunberg or something, but it's just what can the company do? Where can it make a difference? Set up a structure. Think about what you're going to do and make that robust. Otherwise, you might get accused of not really thinking it through properly. And then what information are you going to gather to track, monitor, and as Charlotte says, if you're not monitoring it, you're not managing it. So there's, there's a lot to think about. I have no doubt we'll get some interesting questions. I will pause there and then hand back to Chris. Thank you very much for those presentations and lots of thought-provoking and challenging things there. I'm just having a look, see what we've got. I'm going to have to find my glasses. See what we've got coming through on the um, on, on the Slido. Um, interesting, quite a lot. Um, the um, I'm going to st I'm going to try and capture the spirit of the questions that come through. But I I kind of like to start by picking up on on the point that you were making, Data, and I think is implicit in all of them, which is that there is a cost to this. Okay. Um, if you're going to measure something, you have to put things in place. So, and as with anything that has an element of compliance about it, 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 it can be seen as a cost or it can be seen as a competitive advantage. How do we make sure that this is a competitive advantage? And maybe for companies, but also for us as a jurisdiction. Charlotte? Um, yeah, so I think it's a good point, And I think um, there's a tendency to, for businesses just to see the cost. Um, whereas it absolutely is a, a competitive advantage and for the accountants in the room it's kind of seeing it on the balance sheet as, a, as an asset rather than a, a liability. Um, I think straight away the cost efficiency, so if you're looking at your energy consumption that also results in improvement to your bottom line if you're spending less on energy for example, uh, less on, on water rates etc. But more than that there's also looking at your supply chain so if you've got a resilient supply chain because you've look, had to look at it for reporting purposes you may not be as impacted by macroeconomic factors as we've seen in recent history so there's there's a kind of the the element of uh, direct cost efficiencies and um, looking at strengthening your supply chain and one that's kind of been a theme throughout today is I think around skills. So we all know that there's a bit of a war on skills um, and there's definitely value in um, being seen as a company and um, not just in perception, but with that purpose behind it as well and um, being really transparent about ESG reporting. And so although there may sometimes be a tendency to see a cost, there's definitely value in attracting um, a young workforce. Um, I guess a recent survey for Gen Z and millennials that, that Deloitte did um, this year said that two out of five respondents um, would reject a job or a project if it didn't align with their values. So if you are being honest and transparent and you know this is where we are, this is where we want to, want to get to, um, yes, there's a cost attached to that, but there's also great benefit in attracting skills as well. I think um, it, it's very important, I think, on, on the talent side, but also on the, on the customer side as well, right? We're increasingly seeing, uh, we actually did a survey as well, uh, looking at customers of, um, it's focused on gambling operators, but comparing uh, gambling customers to non-gamblers. And we do find that people are interested in, you know, firms behaving ethically and firms being committed to, to, to different types of ESG values, um, and particularly, obviously, for e-gaming, say, for gambling is the one that comes up again and again. 
and people want to be able to trust you know where they're putting their money in and where they're putting um, where they're putting their effort into as well um, so I think we're increasingly seeing it from customers as well and I think um, that that pressure will only carry on to increase and the other obviously important stakeholder um, who is increasingly uh, interested are regulators um, in the UK in particular we see a lot of um, particularly gambling regulators interested all of ESG but again coming back to safer gambling and the ethical behavioral firms um, and you know as we know from experience which I think in the UK, the gambling industry hasn't necessarily always done the best job of keeping the regulator on side. Um, and so, you know, maybe keeping the regulator on side would, uh, would help immensely going forward, I would say. I feel like I should mention a survey. But I think <laughs> um, no, but uh, I think from my perspective, it's interesting to reflect on the point about um, skills and employees looking to work with organisations that gel with their values. Uh, I used to do a lot of job interviewing and, and still do, and you know that bit at the end where you say, have you got any questions for me? The amount of times ESG comes up now, it did not used to. And, and people are choosing where they go and which organisations they dedicate their time to uh, in a different way these days. So I think that does make a big difference. And it will make a big difference. You asked Chris as, as well about businesses, but also for the island. And diversity is a big thing. We heard Heather talking about the, the government strategy and diversity being a big play here for the island economy. And I, I think us having, the island having an ESG strategy, it will pull people to the island as well in that same way. People are choosing where they want to be and where they want to work. Thank you. Uh, last time I was in this room, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was for, um, it was for a, an energy and um, and essentially a zero carbon conference that was organised by the Energy and Sustainability Centre. And one of the things that came up at that was the fact that, um, I think it was somebody from KPMG who was there, who was actually you know, Simon Nicholas in fact, who said that, um, that the Alaman was in the top 10 locations for Microsoft, and Microsoft got a name um, check just now in terms of sometimes being criticised but also having made some really ambitious claims in terms of what their intentions are and they said that we lost out as an island essentially explicitly on ESG having been one of the top 10 um, global locations they'd identified for a data proposition which has been the theme of the previous presentation and I think that this particular question that's come through Slido came from Rob Jeffries who was obviously here at the same time um, so it's a clearly a very big loss to the digital sector on the island that we weren't able to provide green energy specifically was the problem there um, do, you, do you have any comments from your sort of practice if you like of how important maybe larger clients that you're advising how highly they rate these things when they're looking at a jurisdiction? Um, I, I mean, in short, yes, I think, I think it is vitally important in terms of, um, if I go back to, again, I keep going back to gambling operators who I work a lot with, but increasingly, um, it's coming under increasing pressure in terms of where they locate their data centers, for example, um, and particularly the type of fuel that is used by those data centers. So we've got, we've got a client at the moment who, um, who is looking to review their ESG strategy, but actually you know, most of the data centers are based in Eastern Europe, for example, which use a lot of dirty fuel. Um, and I think places that use those types of fuel, particularly when it comes to data centers, um, are likely to, to lose out, I think, in the future. And it's, everyone's coming under exactly the same types of pressure. So it's something we are, we are increasingly seeing. And as Charlotte talked about the, the supply chain, and it's interesting, yeah, that it's, um, companies will go and, and look to interact in jurisdictions and with other companies that hold the same values because they think, well, I want to operate in an environmentally ethical way or nature positive way or whatever it may be, but I'm not just going to look within my own sphere. I have to look to who I buy from and, I have to, and who I sell to as well because that actually forms part of my footprint on the planet. And so you, you will find it, it, there's, a, there's a virtuous circle to be had somewhere where like, companies will all operate in the same way and we can attract those kind of companies here. I think that would be really positive. Yeah, and I think the I think the Microsoft example is a good one. I mean, but as a digital sector, and this is a digital conference, then elect you know the consumption of power in data centres is probably for almost all digital businesses these days the single biggest impact we have. So I think it's a particularly important thing for us to consider here on the island. Now I've got a question here, which is which is I think probably something which an awful lot of people would really like to understand, which is. Um, what's the best way for a company, would you say, to actually demonstrate its ESG focus and concerns? Is it about trying to do everything? Is it about trying to focus on specific things? What do you, what do you think? Dutton? Well, we all have a view on that one. Yeah, well, I think <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually think the hardest thing uh, is for companies to work out where they will focus, right? And, and, and it's easy to jump into 
we could do a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, and then I, I suspect that slightly more scattergun approach will actually be less impactful in the long term. So it's investing a bit of time up front, um, talking to your stakeholders, really thinking it through to go, right, well, where can we make the most impact? And let's focus on these two or three areas and really get in under the skin of that. Um, and and you can kind of tell which companies, if you read the reporting or their websites, whatever it may be, where companies are communicating this kind of stuff, it, it's actually quite easy to tell which companies have done an in-depth thought and really focused in on something specific rather than a little bit of everything. I, I think to, to your point on your presentation um, earlier about transparency, I think it, there's, there's merit in being really transparent and having an awareness so even if you aren't performing so well in, in certain areas, not just focusing on the ones where you are performing well because that will um, translate and stakeholders will be aware of, I suppose there's a bit of a greenwashing risk there as well. So I think there's more merit in being open about you know, every, everything but where you need to focus on are the, the areas that perhaps aren't as shiny and... and yeah, well, I think it's, it's also quite powerful to... You know, if somebody says, well, what are you doing on this? And you say, well, actually, we concluded that we were best off focusing the time, budget, and attention on these three things. We did think about that, but we prioritised this instead for this reason. You don't have to kind of go, oh, goodness me, we should be doing that too. You know, as long as there's, there's some kind of robust thought between where you're focusing and why, I think that's actually more powerful. Yeah, and I, I think adding to that, in terms of the robust thought, that shouldn't just be internal, right? We're talking about the other stakeholders here, so customers, um, employees, partners, suppliers, so engaging with those people and understanding where they think the kind of the focus should be is also important as well, right? And you know, if they have any concerns or any concerns that have come up in the past and, and what exactly the source of those was and then focusing on that particular area which, you know, you may be not performing as well would definitely be beneficial. Thank you. Um, and a slightly different theme, but the but something I've become increasingly aware of is the fact that, there's, that in financial markets um, there is often an increasing, or it seems to be an increasing focus on both investment in, but also um, you know, managing the, the ESG credentials of, of businesses that are being lent money or being invested in, you know, or, you know, from an equity point of view. How far would you say that was true, and, and, and do you think that's a, a, a trend which will be sustained? <laughs> I, I think it, Charlotte. I think it, it is very true. I think, in, I suppose, looking at an investment manager, for example, they are making investment decisions every day on behalf of their investors and savers. Um, and insofar as, um, I suppose, a fund being marketed in the EU, for example, they're subject to the recent MIFID regulations that require them, um, actually require them to ask their suitability preferences in relation to sustainable funds or not. So even if it's not on the radar of um, all investors um, at the moment, it is certainly a train coming down the track, um, even if it's just a, a tick box exercise to prompt them to think about um, sustainable finance and what their money is being invested into. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree with all of that. And I think where we're particularly seeing it is on the fixed income uh, investment side, we're particularly seeing a focus on ESG. On the equity side, admittedly, there's probably for the time being a little bit less of a focus. But I think that is changing, and um, I promise I won't mention it again. But as part of that survey we were doing, we did talk to one of our one of our big uh, big tech clients, and we're talking to them about the importance when they're looking to raise funds, for example, for a deal, the importance of ESG. And he said, uh, when we tended to engage people, particularly in the US, there's a bit less of an interest, but we are tracking it, and we are every time we go out, um, you know, with with a potential opportunity, we track whether or not people are interested. And although he said maybe you know it's been trending up and it's not there yet. The fact that they're even tracking it probably tells you something. And clearly, they, as Charlotte says, they know it's something coming down the tracks and it, it is increasingly important. And I think that there are jurisdictional differences as well. I definitely think there's maybe less, less of an interest in the US yet, um, but then the UK certainly and the EU clearly there's a, there's a big focus. And the one thing I would add to that as well, I think it's um, the, the, the conceptually, there are funds that people are trying to sort of push towards maybe companies with a more robust ESG strategy, but there's a real challenge at the moment in terms of the information that's there for the investors to utilise and the comparability of well, this company's reporting on X, this company's reporting on Y, we don't have set metrics, nothing's been third party assured. 
how do I compare company A to company B? So that's a big challenge for the investor community as well at the moment, I think, and there's a, there's a lot of movement in that space at the moment, but there's still a long way to go. Just, just to add to that point, it's, it's interesting because if you look at Shell, they've got really good ESG reporting and metrics and you can track and stuff, but should, does that mean then you should invest in them because they've got really good ESG reporting? versus um, you know, maybe a, a company that doesn't have a bit more immature or you know, your point, but you know, is genuinely net zero and net nature positive. If you take a look, you'll see that big tobacco also are fairly comprehensive ESG strategies. Yeah. And the miners, and well, the, the companies that were pushed into doing it sooner than it being mandated, I think, because of the industries they're in, because of the underlying societal pressure that's there. That's really interesting, actually, isn't it? I mean, it does come play to that you can measure it and you can manage it as well. So, so, but at the same time, if if you, if you can measure it because you've got a lot of it, that may not be a good thing. Um, the uh, that's that's very interesting. I, I I I've got a kind of follow-on question of my own really here, which is because we talk quite a bit about some of the global landscape, and and obviously, you know, here in the Alamand, we can sometimes feel quite you know quite insulated from some of those things. Um, and equally, we can kind of feel like we can deal with markets where we're perhaps a little less interested in these things and therefore it's not so important to us. But I mean, I kind of like to know what you'll think about the fact that, I mean, often the EU and Brexit and various other things have had a lot of mentions today, one way or another, from, uh, from the stage. And I think the EU is often seen as being a sort of leader in, in quote, progressive kind of regulation and, and standards and sometimes people kick against that. That's bad. You know, seen as over-regulation, but equally it tends to drive an awful lot of innovation as well, and that's true in things like digital identity and all sorts of other areas which are, are relevant to us. But I'm really interested to know what your views as global companies really are of how much the focus, the, the sort of almost thought leadership that tends to come from Europe, how far that will and how quickly that will percolate elsewhere, or whether it will there'll be a con a con an ongoing divide there. I mean, will the rest of the world catch up? I'm, I'm going to say yes. Maybe that's because I'm evangelical about this stuff. I don't know. Catch up or, or at least move, the, move closer. I mean, there's a huge amount of push on this down in Australasia as well, some of the Asian markets. So it, it's not... It's interesting, the different jurisdictions seem to focus on different things. You get more society, it's more on the social side pushing through the EU, more on the climate side in the UK. You know, it, different governments, I guess, focus on whatever is high on their agenda and push it into the regulation for the companies. Um, but I get the impression that this is a, a global shift, really. So, I, I mean, I would expect at some point on Ireland we might start seeing things coming through as well. Um, not any time soon, I'm going to guess, not mandatory, but at some point, I can believe. I th and I think it comes down to, it again, I know you mentioned this, but the societal pressure, there's, there's definitely increasing societal pressure for wanting to buy of companies that do have ESG initiatives, are doing the right thing, um, you know, are, are, are managing um, the planet as well. So, so I think it's, it will come from regulators, but it's definitely there's that societal pressure that is building, I think, across the piece that, that will be, that will lead to, yeah, mandatory requirements. And I think as well, it's, it's relatively still early in the standard setting process. I think there's over 600 different um, standards or, or frameworks that a company can adopt at the moment. Um, and there is a convergence process going on um, that ISSB uh, are doing. I think the US are kind of going their own way, although they've said they'll look at the, the task force on climate um, released financial disclosures. But I, I suppose once there is that convergence process and there is a, a recognised, or at least a handful rather than 600 recognised standards, um, that also makes it easier for individual jurisdictions to adopt something. Um, but yeah, I think before legislation and regulation um, comes in, I think that will catch up with societal pressures rather than the, the other way around. Thank you. I, I've got a question here which is, which is from, a, from a, a startup. Um, it really is how does one, right in the very early days, you know, the birth of an organisation, how do you start off on the right foot? But I'd, I'd like to, because uh, I've been in, I, I'm, I obviously have some experience of this for our own business in PDMS where we where we do a lot of tendering for UK government business where where both social, um, you know, well, all the aspects of ESG, but particularly the S and the E, actually, are directly addressed in every tender that we that we, you know, that we fill in it. So clearly, even the smallest business would be affected that if they're part of one of those supply chains. And also in some of the discussions around 
within the SME commu digital community in the UK, which I've been involved in, there's been a lot of that same question, which is how do you make this palatable for smaller organisations? How do you make this something which is easy to do? And um, so the underlying question, the question I'd like to distill out of that, again, it's a, a little bit of a jurisdiction level. We, you've said that there's not much coming, but should there be? Would it actually be a benefit to Manx businesses, large and small, if we were able to set really clear ESG standards and nail our colours to the mast around the things which are really going to matter to us as a jurisdiction, perhaps in the context of biosphere, perhaps in the context of well-regulated financial jurisdiction, that we can actually make it easier for people to make some of these decisions? Yeah, I think it's a really tricky one. It, it, it reminds me, we talked before we uh, got up on stage together, it reminds me of a conversation, ongoing debate I have with my other half, who is uh, involved in a smaller business, and, and he finds this extremely challenging because you know, the idea of starting broadly and working out where to focus and so on requires so much time investment that it's difficult for a management team of two or three people to, to carve that out and how are you going to do it? And he says to me, I kind of wish the government would just say, it's diversity, give me some diversity stats. Or it's carbon emissions, give me some carbon emission stats. And, and my kind of counter to that was, well, on one hand, I absolutely agree because at least then some change would start coming through. The other hand is though, um, that doesn't necessarily work for all industries. It's quite difficult to come up with these are the two or three things that every company has to collect and this is what matters. When you have a, an e-gaming company compared to a miner compared to someone farming cattle, you know, it, it will be different. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I could believe that some specifics might come through because it will help the government's agenda to move the island in a certain direction. And if I was a betting lady, I'd say it might come with environmental stuff first. Yeah, and I think it's not it's not a one size fits all. So, and there's an element of proportionality um, that has to be applied. So, yeah, smaller companies um, aren't going to have as much or, or resource even to pull together some of the reporting. But to the point we discussed earlier around what actually matters to them, in the same way that businesses and, and listed businesses have to disclose on the climate risk. Those risks are different for every business, so I think it's really hard to just ask for a set of specific metrics from all companies. And I think instead, if there was mandatory um, requirements, it would be to look at um, you know specific metrics that are important to the, the company and the risks that are important to the company on a proportionate basis. And, and I think being a startup, right, you're starting from a bit of a clean slate to some degree as well. I know there's time investment involved, but where we where we find companies that have issues potentially with ESG strategies is where you've got such an ins inset or ingrained mindset that it's very very hard to switch from that. But you know, investing some of the time up front, and okay, you might not have an all singing, all dancing ESG strategy rate up straight off the bat, but it's in especially important, I think, as a start to set you know, the vision of what type of company you want to be, what are the type of values you want to have as a company, what are the type of, who are the type of people you want to employ, and then really going from there, um, which is, I guess, a little bit easier when you're a startup and you've got that, you've got that clean slate to start from. It's funny as well, I mean, we, we talk about you know, having an ESG strategy and you think, well, yeah, but if, if you're a, a start startup, the strategy is often, it's, it's, in, it's in somebody's head, isn't it? Like even the, the business strategy, not just ESG. I don't have a written down strategy on lots of glossy pages to put on a website. That's not quite how it works, but you have a plan, an idea, a purpose in your head. And, and I mean, I sort of agree with Seamus, if you're starting off now, I'm going to guess that some of this dimension is already in your thoughts anyway. I think it's just about doing, thinking, of, choosing something consciously and following that path, right? Rather than having a 20 page document all glossily written out. I mean, the glossy document helps occasionally as well, but it's not only startups that don't have them, to be fair. So. It's always very important that you've actually issued a questionnaire at some point that's uh, odd on a survey. You get a survey to fill Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we've, we've, we've got literally 60 seconds left of our lot of time, so I'm going to ask each of you just for one final thought or the one thing that you'd like people to take away from what we've had to say today. And, uh, shall we? Yeah, I, I think it would just be, um, I suppose, not being um, fixed mindset or, or naive on, on the other man that this doesn't apply to us um, even if the you know mandatory requirements aren't there yet because even as your directors as with fiduciary responsibilities um, enterprise value will need to be protected and that will include addressing some of these societal pressures. Yeah I think for me it would be 
we talk a lot about the potential cost of ESG, but it, it's a huge opportunity. The compet- as, you, as you mentioned at the start, Chris, the competitive advantage from getting these things right, I genuinely think will be huge. And, and you already talked about government contracts. So, for example, in the UK, the S is heavily relied upon. They also, there's a commitment that anyone winning a UK con- government contract needs to be net zero by 2050. Not necessarily that ambitious, uh, but I'm sure others will, will, join, will join that as well. Yeah, I, I guess I, I end up actually then reiterating kind of what you both said there. I, I, I said at a, a previous event, I told Tom, I'll put it this way, I said you just don't want to be Kodak. You know, Kodak, there was a huge change coming and for some reason they didn't take it as seriously or move as quickly in, and this was technological change um, and it really was detrimental to their company whereas if they'd em- embraced it or kind of stepped towards it a bit and thought well, what are we going to do about this, maybe uh, it wouldn't have been quite such a... Uh, downward trajectory. So, I mean, yeah, I'm reiterating what you both said. There's value to be gained. So it's a, it should be seen as a competitive advantage, not a cost, and addressed in that way. I'd like everyone to, to thank the panel very much in the usual way, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you.